what's up, bookworms, beltalotas, and baradnas? Mike here today to talk to you about something very near and dear to me, and that is The Expanse series by James S.A. Corey. So let's spin the drum, Sasuke. Trust me, all this will make a lot of sense after you read this series, uh, because there is so much going on in this world that I want to talk to you guys today about why you should not only read this series, but you should watch the series. But this is mostly about the books and why you should read them. Now, for those who don't know, uh, this is a series written by a under a pseudonym of James S. A. Corey. This is a fantasy author named Daniel Abraham. You might know him from the Long Price Quartet or uh, the Dagger and the Coin. And another author named Ty Frank, who actually worked under George R. R. Martin for a long time. Uh, if he's done anything on his own, I'm not really sure about. But the two of them decided to team up and write this science fiction series called uh, The Expanse. Uh, they started in 2011 with Leviathan Wakes, a very, very underrated and I don't want to say I want to say I can say underrated because this book was so big it kind of launched the series that they are now about to write the ninth and final book in uh, this year. So uh, not only are they prolific, uh, they are very very well done, and you have two guys, uh, so you have a buffer. You don't have to worry about uh, what the hell would you think in there. Uh, so that's obviously a very neat idea that I wish kind of I don't know maybe some more authors would should do. It's a really really seems to have worked out very very well. Now let me just set this up for you. The whole premise of this series is it's about, it doesn't really give you an exact date, but uh, it, it's about it's about 200 years in our future. And, you know, you have, Earth has, has they've colonized Mars, uh, and we have uh, actually kind of moved around the solar system. We, we haven't gone interstellar yet. We're still within our own solar system, but, you know, we've created uh, uh, drives that allow us to explore our own solar system. Uh, but uh, over time, uh, there has been a lot of tensions between Earth and Mars, and uh, then what we call the outer planets, uh, you know, the belt and things like that, where they actually feel like, you know what, we're not, we're, neither one of these governments are acknowledging us, and, you know, we want to be an established people too. And so they feel like they're kind of stepped on and used for their resources in the belt because ice and water is obviously one of the most valuable resources in the planet, and you get a lot of that outside of the asteroid belt. So, uh, Earth and Mars are kind of pointing guns to each other right now. And uh, so that, that's what it was about is there's these, you got these two nations on the precipice of war here. And, you know, it's you want to look at it this way, it's kind of like another civil war. So it's it's very, very believable future. And I think that's what I like so much about it because the technology, while advanced from ours, it isn't anything. You know, you don't have photon lasers and things like that. You don't have light speed. Yeah, we travel, you know, faster, but it's not like, hey, you know, turn a page and boom, we're the next planet. Uh, it's nothing like that. It's very, very believable. And you could see us being here 200 years from now. That's what makes it so relatable because it's just so realistic. You could see it actually happen. You could see technology advancing this way. Like they all have, they all have like their personal assistant phones or whatever, but they're, they're, you could see that being what our phones evolve to eventually. Little bits of info and science like that that really make it seem, okay, this is science fiction. But it also looks like it could be a peek into the future because it's not just like, it's not Buck Rogers or something here. You're not just so advanced. You're like, that's unrecognizable. No, our society is very, very recognizable in what's going on in these books. Uh, but I guess I kind of say it's kind of multi-genre in that it isn't just science fiction, as in not just science fiction fans are going to be the ones who enjoy this series. Uh, I have said about the television series many times that I feel like it transcends that genre because you have your drama, you have your action adventure, you have your noir detective story, you have your political intrigue. It's got everything. I mean, it's, it's everything from science fiction, drama, thriller. There's even some horror in there. Uh, I, I really do feel like while it is science fiction, you know, when it's going to go on in the bookshelves under science fiction, obviously it's got a lot of other things like you talk especially about the first book where you've got three main arcs you've got the un which controls earth now right imagine that uh, so the un controls controls earth uh so there you've got your your big polit political story going on and then on uh on on out in space you've got your space adventure with, with, with holden and his crew and then you know on series station you've got miller with this missing girl detective story uh it really is it's just like a, a noir political space adventure all wrapped into one book and that's really what what caught my attention and i will not lie i did not even hear of this series until the television show came out and the television show was sold to me as mike you're a big fan of the 2000 and god what year was it 2003 or 4 the battlestar galactica reboot 
Uh, loved it. So say we all. Big time fan. And every science fiction show that came on after that, like, the next Battlestar Galactica. And it never was. Never was. It was always a big disappointment. So when people were telling me that about this series, I was like, yeah, okay. I'll add it to the list of the battles, next Battlestar Galactica that you guys always tell me on. Not only was it, I, in many regards, I feel like that show has actually exceeded Battlestar Galactica. And that means a lot coming from someone like me because I absolutely adore Battlestar Galactica. So... When I watched that first season, I loved it so much. And that big cliffhanger ending, uh, I went out and I got Leviathan Wakes. And I read it in like three days. And it isn't a, it isn't a light read by any imagination. Uh, but I also I went ahead and got the second book too and read it. And then when the second season of the show came out, I was kind of upset with myself. Because what I enjoyed so much about that show was the twists and turns and surprises about it. And I felt like I had ruined those for me by reading ahead. And in most cases where I say I like to read it before I see the adaptation, this is the exception to that. Because what I enjoy so much about that show, and guys, don't get me wrong. This is the best show on TV right now. And if you're not watching it, you're doing it wrong. It is incredible television. You do not have to like science fiction to get this either. It is that good. So I was like, you know what, I'm just going to stop. I got the third book, haven't read it yet. I do plan to read it. The fourth season of the show is coming direct to Amazon, and that's going to be book four. I don't have it to show you because I don't own it yet. So what I plan to do is read uh, Abaddon's Gate, and then I'm going to read book four, uh, Shibola Burn. If it's Shibola or Cibola, I'm not really sure how it's pronounced. Uh, maybe the show will tell me. But I plan on reading both of those back-to-back -back, uh, in early 2020 because uh, what that's my plan is once the season of the show is over, then go read the book because I don't want to be losing any of the twists and turns that that show provides. Uh, but back to the actual books. Uh, another thing I think that could be a selling point to you is you hear a lot of things now about how uh, forced diversity and multi multicultural ethnicities and all that kind of stuff. A lot of series, it is forced, and it doesn't feel organic. It doesn't feel real. It feels like someone's going through and kind of checking the boxes. I hate that term, but that it does feel like what it is. With this, it feels completely natural. You have so many, what's the term they use now, people of color? They have so much of that. They have so many different religions, nationalities, uh, sexual identities. They have uh, homosexual relationships. All of this stuff that you can imagine and, and want in a series like this, and it's so completely normal, no one even discusses it. It's just normal. It's just life. Again, that's how I can see us being 200 years from now. You know, yeah, everything's really super heightened politically right now. But 200 years from now, you can see it getting to the point where this is just what it's like. You know, no one's going on about identity politics. It's just that's now the identity politics is I'm an earther, you're a Martian, and you're a stinking belter. That's what it is now, you know. And so that to me makes so much sense. And I love that about this series. You know, one of the main protagonists, protagonists, that's that's something that I I shouldn't really use because much like uh, a Game of Thrones or a Joe Abercrombie, uh, these are all great characters. Uh, anyone that you consider a uh, an antagonist in this book, you can look at it like there's many times where I've been like, I can't believe Blank is doing this. That's just so dark and screw the belt. And then I'll like get it from their point of view and I'm like, well, you know what? They kind of got a point. You know, numerous times who you think is the villain, you can sit there and look at it and be like, they're not wrong, you know, so there is no real uh, protagonist, antagonist, uh, so to speak. But it really depends. You read this and you start thinking, oh, I'm an earther, you know, because <laughs> we're from Earth. Uh, but uh, Christian uh, Avasarala, I believe she's Pakistani, and she is probably my favorite character in the series. And she's it's just, it's such a different kind of character than you're used to reading in this type of series. And it's just, man, God, these characters are so good, every one of them. And you will just learn to love all of them because the character growth and the bond that grows. You know, not just the, the Rosinante crew. Now you have, you know, characters like Bobby, who's from Mars. And then you got Holden, who's from Earth. And they're like, they're creating friendships. It's just, it's just stuff that you don't expect to see happens. But it's so natural. The growth in this is so organic and perfectly well paced that you're going to fall in love with a number of these characters, if not all of them. Uh... Amos was a character I thought was just a big meathead, and he's got so many layers that the more and more I learn about him, and I'm only two books in, guys, that I'm like, wow, I want to know more about this. But you just 
quickly fall in love with this crew of the Rosinante and the characters that you think you hate, you end up understanding and coming to an understanding with them. And uh, within a couple of days, you'll be speaking, speaking Belter Creole. Uh, there isn't a lot of you know techno babble jargon in this or whatever. What they have is out in the belt, they kind of speak uh, with a little like Cajun Creole slang. And they do it a lot on here. They've kind of cre- they've got kind of adapted some words and they've kind of adjusted some words and kind of created some of their own. But you'll find yourself uh, uh, talking like that uh, quite a quite a lot, boss man, if you know what I mean. Uh, so again, this very multicultural, multi diversity, all that stuff that you're looking for in something like this, it hits it. And again, uh, something a phrase I hear a lot is, "Oh yeah, well they force it down our throat." It's not like that with this, like at all. It, again, it feels perfectly natural, organic. Is organic is the word that I would definitely use to describe all of that. But uh, again, the character growth and the bonds, the friendships, they'll hit you hard. And there are there is one one character where if you've uh, if you've got young kids, uh, you're going to relate so much with them, and you'll be hitting the feels more than once. Another thing I really like is the witty dialogue. You would think something like this, uh, dealing with a, a, a harsh because you know space obviously is very harsh. It's it's not. Space is scary. I've said that before. They, they, they've tried to take stuff like Star Wars and Star Trek and make space look sexy, you know, and in some ways it is. But space, we're not supposed to be there. It's like the ocean, but even worse. You know, we're not supposed to be there. And it, it, it shows it how scary it is and how, how dank and, and sometimes hopeless that it can be. So when you have witty dialogue and, and you know, perfectly placed, well-timed humor... It works so well. I mean, there's there's sometimes where some of these characters, like one is actually talking to herself, telling herself not to be scared. She actually starts re- uh, reciting the Litany of Fear from Dune, and she calls herself a dork. And I just thought that was classic, obviously, being a big, a big dork, a Dune fan. But uh, the, the humor is very, very well placed, and it never, ever feels like it takes away. The big moments are still the big moments, but, you know, there is some comic relief. But it never takes away from the levity. You know, it, the levity obviously helps balance out the extreme tension that this series can have sometime. Um, incredible action. The action in this is bar none. Uh, you're, you're not going to find more well-written space action than you're going to find in this. And you're not going to see it written more accurately, in my opinion. I'll get into the physics and the science in just a minute. But, uh, yeah, it's just, again... You're having a great time. You're biting your nails. You're holding your breath. You're fist pumping. All this stuff happens with the action in this. It's it's so well written. And again, I don't know who the lead writer on this is. Uh, if it's Ty Frank or Daniel Abraham or how that works or whatever. But the prose is fantastic, especially in the action. So uh, you will never, ever be bored while reading this series for sure. Uh, let's talk about that the science because... What I think the number one thing that differentiates this from every other epic science fiction series that you've read out there, it is scientific accuracy. Now, I'm no scientist. Uh, The closest I've got is going and seeing Neil deGrasse Tyson, uh, a seminar I went and saw of his on physics. Uh, That's the closest I could tell you anything about physics. Calculus, it was never my strong point. I just like to look at the stars and the planets, you know, just like everybody else. So that never really was a thing that I knew that I needed in my science fiction. But the first season of the show, what really opened my eyes was gravity is basically a character in this series. Because you can never, ever take the easy way out when writing this and say, oh, we'll just do this and this. Apparently, they've got consult- science consultants, and they've talked to people from NASA and all this kind of stuff. and done all their research to be like, is this possible to do here? And I'm like, no, you can't do that because, you know, you're in certain amounts of gravity, and, and the human body can't take that kind of thrust and force and, and inertia. It's done in a way, though, where you're not going to need a Ph.D. in science to understand what they're talking about. But they do uh, hold themselves accountable and be like, if this couldn't happen in real life because... Gravity is a very real thing. If this can't happen, if this, this we're not going to break the laws of physics to write this scene. And it makes something so little count so much. And the real villain of the series is gravity. Okay? Uh, it, uh, God, the scientists, it's, it's so good. But again, if you're one of those people like, oh, I don't like a lot of... It's not techno babble. And I never feel like it gets to a point where they're drawing you know, calculus threads on the page. It's nothing like that. 
I'm sure it helps. And if you go to the, the Expanse Reddit, you'll see there are people who go in there and do that. But uh, you don't have to be a, a big math and science nerd to appreciate how important physics and science are for this series. So that right there alone said, well, this is different than every other science fiction series I've ever read where they're like, oh, we're just going to hop between ships and stuff like that. It's not that easy. It's not that easy. You can't control a vacuum. You know, it's, 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 it's so well done. I, I, I know I've said that about six times now, but it makes me actually want... <laughs> here's, the, here's the truth. I was a full-time student this late in life, and because of this series, when I had to take some electives... I didn't take anything that, you know, most people take that's easy. I took Astrophysics 1 and 2 because of this series, because I was so interested in it. Regretted it after I took it, but that's, that's, that's what it got me to. But, I mean, lastly, guys, why you should read this is the twists and the turns are second to none. I know everyone likes to use the phrase now, it's Game of Thrones and blank. And I know that the tag, this is Game of Thrones in space, got applied to it. And with Ty Frank working on it, you can see how that might be a relation. This is very much its own thing. Yes, the characters are gray. Yes, major characters die. There's going to be some very, very upsetting things that happen in these books. Because, again, space is scary. What can I say that I can't spoil for you here? If you've watched the show, you know that they hit on these big moments. But there are twists and turns that are so unpredictable, so crazy, but seem based in fact that your jaw will just drop open, that you can't believe that that actually just happened. And guys, I cannot stress enough, pick up Leviathan Wakes right now. Because you will not be let down. You will immediately run to the store or pick up your Kindle or go to Amazon and you will buy Caliban's War immediately because... Book one is probably the best book one of a science fiction series outside of Ender's Game that I have ever read. It is really, really, really good. And then you're going to want to immediately watch the show. Uh, I obviously recommend that you read the book before you watch the show. Usually, in this case, I'm going to say watch the show before you read the book because I feel like ah, you're probably going to see some differences. Because there are differences. It's very, very faithful, but there are a lot of differences uh, the big moments are the same. The characters are mostly the same. There are some differences, but again, nothing that I feel like detracts it. Now, I'll end this by talking about the TV series in case you haven't. Um, this is a TV series that uh, I latched onto really quick. Like I said, I was looking for that next Battlestar. And uh, while it's not similar, uh, I definitely feel like it's, it's it can actually take that title. And in many ways, I feel like it succeeded it. I know a lot of people didn't trust Sci-Fi Channel. And you know they proved that by canceling the show, which was a media darling. Uh, I mean, I think it was like the last two seasons were 100% on Rotten Tomatoes. Um, I think it won a Peabody Award or something like that. But uh, it was one of those things where when it got canceled, you felt like, okay, it's going to get picked up by somebody. Because it's got a huge fan base. There's a huge Save the Expanse campaign going on. You knew it was going to get picked up by somebody. But until it happened, I wasn't going to get excited. I was obviously pulling for Amazon because I do happen to know that Jeff Bezos is a very big fan of the series. Uh, when he actually debuted the Kindle, and he held it up for this crowd to see, the book that was on his Kindle was Leviathan Wakes. Uh, so he is a very big fan of the series, and hear it told now, uh, it sounds like he's upset that he didn't get the series when it was first being pitched. He, uh, you know, before uh, what, the Sky Canada One or Sky One or whatever it was called got it, and, and Sci-Fi got the distribution. So this kind of feels like a homecoming, even though it was never their series in the first place. But all you have to do is watch the trailers uh, for the new season and see that it still feels like the same show, but there might be a little more budget. Vassarala is going to curse all, as much as she does in the book. And uh, you're probably going to see the uh, the sex and profanity taken to 11 on this. So uh, I can only see good things of it. They like it so much, apparently, they've already greenlit a season five. So that's great. So I at least got, you know, five of the books getting adapted. I don't see why this series doesn't go to completion. I think another thing that makes this show so special is that Daniel Abraham and Ty Frank both are part of the show running team for the show. Uh, you can see a lot of the times when they have the credits in the front of the screen, it says, you know, uh, this episode uh, screenplay was written by Daniel Abraham and Ty Frank. So I think that's a big reason why they're able to keep it so faithful to the books. Obviously, if you've got the authors in-house, you see a lot of that with these shows where they get adapted and the, the actual author has nothing, no, no creative input whatsoever or whatever. So uh, I think that's kind of what's kind of helped them uh, toe the line and make sure that they keep the series 
as faithful to the books as possible. Now, I might actually read the books and be, you know, once I read three and four and be like, you oh, know, no, they're, they're changing quite a few things. I'm sure there is some things that have to be changed for television or if they want, you know, different characters to be in different places or if there's a situation where a character is more popular on the screen than they are in the book, they might extend the role or expand the role or, or maybe not kill them off when they think that they're supposed to kill them off. Things like that. I don't know. I don't know. We'll talk about it soon. But uh, I this Friday is, is the new series comes out on Amazon. You can watch the whole series on there in 4K if you have a 4K compatible TV. Uh, I watched the series when it was going. My wife never really watched with me. Uh, I was like, I want to do a rewatch for season four. Will you watch with me? And we burned through it in like two weeks, and she absolutely loves it. I mean, this morning, uh, we finished the, the season three, the last season, last night. And this morning, she uh, she woke me up all talking about what she wants to see happen in season four. So, uh, again, she said it's the best show she's seen since Breaking Bad. So, you know, obviously right there, it's a very high accolade. So, uh, watch the series. Read the books, guys. Again, try Leviathan Wakes. I guarantee if you like science fiction in the least, you will not be disappointed. This isn't uh, Star Wars or anything like that. This is straight up space opera, but set in a believable universe 200 years from now. Technology that you can believe. Characters that you can relate with. And I'm pretty sure that you're going to be able to relate with more than one character in this book. So, guys, that is why you should read The Expanse. So do yourself a favor and pick up Leviathan Wakes and, uh, and drop in the comments and talk to me. Uh, I haven't finished past uh, book two, so please keep the spoilers uh, just for the first book or two if you can. And uh, But, again, if you have any questions about The Expanse, about why you should read it, please hit me up, man. I'll, I'll talk to you for days about this series. I can't wait to read uh, Abaddon's Gate and, and Chibola Burn later this year. So uh, hit me in the comments, guys, and I'll talk to you there.